Thank you very much. I'm really keen on talking about TRIPS later and looking at the Biden administration and its unique approach to intellectual property access to medicines and the crime of violence. This work really comes out of um, a couple of decades of working on access to central medicines, um, really as part of a community of scholars. And it's wonderful that um, so many great contributors in that field, like Professor Charles Lawson, for instance, are, uh, are here today to contribute to those discussions. So I feel like it's been a dialogue that's been going on for many years. Um, as is always the case at QT, we'd like to acknowledge the Turrbal of Yugra as the First Nations owners of the land where QT now stands. And questions around access to essential medicines are particularly significant and important for First Nations communities at the moment. Uh, I can't remember when I was advising Terry Janke having a very melancholy discussion about, you know, whether the discussion in Indigenous intellectual property did need to take into account health issues like access to essential medicines. And as we've certainly seen in terms of the coronavirus pandemic in Australia, Indigenous communities have been particularly vulnerable. Uh, so I think that's a worthwhile context in which to think about this issue as well. Just to begin my talk, I'd just like to kind of think back to an event that we held at QT several years ago, uh, which um, featured the Honourable Michael Kirby, who was kind of talking about his role in the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on access to medicines. And really he was talking about a number of initiatives that were being put forward to try to resolve some of the age-old disputes between pharmaceutical companies and national governments over access to essential medicines. At the time, he said, we need to dream big and need bold suggestions to bring international intellectual property rights in line with human rights. Every contribution can affect the lives of millions in the future. And really, in some ways, those thoughts are quite prophetic uh, because I think the debate around the TRIPS waiver is exactly that. It's a, it's a debate about how can we transform our regime of international intellectual property to better deal with global challenges like access to central medicines. I guess my regret would be uh, the United States, other uh, developed nations, big industry representative groups essentially stonewalled the recommendations of the high level panel led by Ruth Dreyfus and featuring many other eminent personalities. And I think it's a tremendous shame that we didn't implement some of those general recommendations. Uh, perhaps we would have been in a better position to deal with the coronavirus pandemic. Um, if we had engaged in that process of reform led by those eminent persons. Um, as my colleague, Dr. Abbas, has kind of noted, there's a crisis at the moment in terms of access to essential medicines, particularly in relation to vaccines for COVID. Uh, there are terrible inequities in terms of the distribution of vaccines around the world at the moment. Uh, and really, this has been described in a number of different ways. Some have talked about it in terms of vaccine inequity. Um, some have talked about vaccine nationalism. Uh, the lead of South Africa has kind of talked about vaccine apartheid. Uh, there have been various different proposals that have been mooted to address and deal with this problem. Um, in particular, there has been a lot of discussion about a people's vaccine campaign, which has been focused on trying to ensure that vaccines are in the public domain, are cheap and accessible and available. Um, and in many ways, that campaign then transmogrified into a very kind of specific push uh, for a trips waiver. And my colleague, Dr. Abbas, has kind of outlines the initial amber claims in relation to TRIPS waiver and then some of the revisions that took place in terms of the proposal. Uh, my presentation today is really going to be focusing upon the decision of the Biden administration to support a TRIPS waiver for vaccines. Uh, and I really want to kind of dance around the US politics in relation to the TRIPS waiver and kind of deal with some of the equivocations within the American system. I think this talk partly kind of comes out of doing lots of work on the Trans-Pacific Partnership 
and having to look deeply at US politics around the intellectual property and trade and kind of coming out of that and thinking about is this a kind of a new transitional moment in terms of the approach of the United States in relation to intellectual property trade and public health. So to begin with, I'd just like to kind of take you back to the Obama administration. Uh, the Obama administration in some ways was very much alert and alarmed by the threat of pandemics and public health emergencies. I was visiting uh, Washington, D.C. back in 2014 and having chats to the White House uh, Office for Science and Technology. Uh, they seemed very kind of concerned about questions about dealing with the threat of global pandemics. Um, they also uh, worked on a playbook for early response to high consequence emerging infectious disease threats and biological incidents. Having said that, the Obama administration was curiously contradictory when it came to intellectual property and public health. At a domestic level, uh, Obama had run on a platform that he was going to uh, take action in relation to drug prices. Uh, he was going to also transform the approach of the United States in relation to uh, how it dealt in terms of trade with other nations. Once he um, entered into power, he took quite a hard line in pushing for TRIPS Plus and TRIPS Double Plus standards in relation to intellectual property rights in proposals like the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, uh, in negotiations over the transfer suit partnership. Uh, he was not necessarily uh, very flexible when it came to exceptions and defences, particularly around access to essential medicines. Former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull uh, reminisces in his blockbuster autobiography of uh, having these personal chats to Obama and suggesting it was, you know, a bit rich for Obama to press for Australia to have stronger IP protections on uh, pharmaceutical drugs and medicines and biologics when, you know, Obama had campaigned personally that he was going to try to reduce prices in those areas. So I, I guess that was kind of an interesting context in which to move into the Trump administration. The Trump administration was very much an isolationist institution. So my colleague Dr. Abbas talked about the legitimacy of the World Trade Organization being under a cloud. Um, the Trump administration in many ways attacked the institution of the World Trade Organization undermine its operation by refusing to appoint new members to its uh, appellate body, um, engaged in big intellectual property battles in the World Trade Organization with its fellow superpower, China. Uh, it was also very hostile to the World Health Organization as a multilateral uh, institution. Uh, it was often very hostile to proposals around intellectual property sharing. Uh, while Trump uh, was horrified by the Trans-Pacific Partnership and pulled the United States out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, he nonetheless did push for TRIPS Plus and did TRIPS Double Plus standards in agreements like the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. When it came to the issue of access to central medicines, Trump pursued an America First policy, which showed a complete disregard for the rest of the world when it came to accessing medicines. There was high umbrage from Germany and the European Union when Trump tried to make pitches to allegedly buy out German biotechnology companies working on vaccines. Of course, the Trump administration was also very kind of chaotic in terms of its response to the COVID crisis domestically, spewing forth streams of COVID misinformation um, and disinformation, um, sending very mixed or mixed messages about vaccination, uh, but also showing a, a kind of a level of chaos and incompetence in terms of managing what was going on in the United States. Um, and I guess that had kind of ramifications globally. You know, often we would rely upon the CDC and the United States to help coordinate action against um, global public health epidemics. 
and under the Trump administration, that organisation could not play that sort of role. So the United States Congress were very alarmed by what was happening in terms of the Trump administration and were putting a lot of pressure on the Biden administration to take decisive action to provide for access to essential medicines at home and abroad. Uh, a number of Democrats sent a letter uh, to uh, Biden emphasising that our globalised economy cannot recover if only parts of the world are vaccinated. In the end, the TRIPS waiver will help us all. This TRIPS waiver is key for countries to manufacture necessary supplies of COVID-19 treatments and vaccines, and the current flexibilities in TRIPS are ill-suited to an urgent global crisis, uh, and they kind of also noted some of the problems around um, compulsory licensing. Uh, Representative Roe Cannon has kind of been a very kind of important voice in the debate. Uh, American Indian uh, Silicon Valley representative. Um, he has been very kind of alarmed by the impact of the pandemic on Southeast Asia and has made lots of representations to Biden, noting that if you're going to profess to stand up for human rights and for dignity, that it begins by allowing every person to have access to a vaccine. You can't stand up for human rights and then privileged profits and corporations over people's human rights. That is hypocrisy. We know that when you have a TRIPS waiver, you will incentivise manufacturing across the world. Moreover, other presidential candidates like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren uh, provided very strong advocate, uh, advocacy for access to uh, medicines when they were running for president, but also afterwards they were placing pressure upon Biden and kind of pleading with him that your administration has the opportunity to reverse the damage done by the Trump administration to our nation's global reputation and restore America's global uh, public health leadership on the world stage. You know, to bring the pandemic to its quickest end and save the lives of Americans and people around the world, we ask that you prioritise people over pharmaceutical profits. And that was backed up by a network of civil society organisations running um, public campaigns, pushing for access to essential medicines, and people's vaccine. So Oxfam, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Public Citizen, and many others campaigned heavily um, for a TRIPS waiver. But here's part, President Joe Biden has a rather complicated story when it comes to intellectual property and trade. You know, when I was kind of digging back <coughs> through his long pedigreed history, uh, traditionally, he has been quite a vocal supporter for stronger, longer intellectual property rights, both when he was within Congress and also when he was a presidential candidate, uh, but also when he was vice president. Uh, he was a key supporter for the Trans Pacific Partnership and pushed for broad protection in relation to intellectual property rights. Um, he was not considered to be someone who is necessarily amenable to having lots of intellectual property flexibilities within the regime. Nonetheless, uh, there does seem to be a number of factors that might have helped him change his position uh, around intellectual property, public health and trade during the current COVID crisis. Biden uh, has no doubt uh, had the privilege of witnessing what has happened previously to democratic leaders who have supported pharmaceutical drug companies in battles over access to essential medicines. So he no doubt recalls the massive backlash against Bill Clinton and Al Gore over supporting Big Pharma against South Africa in the 1990s. And rather shamefacedly, Clinton and Gore then kind of retreated to a position of neutrality in that dispute. Uh, but I think that was a very significant moment in time, which may have affected his position in relation to the debate over the TRIPS waiver. It's been interesting to see that the Clinton's daughter has come out during the present debates as a champion of the TRIPS waiver. 
So obviously she has had particular views about the position of the Clintons in relation to intellectual property and access to central medicines. I think at a more kind of personal level, I think it's really important to remember that Biden's life has really been affected and defined by great family tragedy. Uh, both the uh, death of his wife and a child in a car crash, um, but later the, the death of a uh, uh, son from cancer, has meant that he has a very finely attuned sense of bereavement and grief. So when he kind of came to the presidency, I thought it was quite a moving moment that the president and the vice president kind of held a COVID memorial and engaged in a kind of a process of having an elegy about the impact of COVID, particularly in the United States, on so many different families. So I think there's a kind of a really interesting point of empathy within uh, the president, uh, uh, Joe Biden, and his kind of approach to access to essential medicines. Uh, but moreover, it sounds like from his press secretary that there was a kind of a very significant debate about what should happen in terms of the position of the Biden administration in relation to the TRIPS waiver. He asked various different members of his staff to put forward competing positions. Uh, so they kind of came up with this very um, compromised position for there to be a TRIPS waiver for vaccine. So not quite the full proposal that was put forward by South Africa and India, uh, but some way there. Uh, Catherine Tai, the United States Trade Representative, has kind of explained the position of the United States in these terms. She has said, this is a global health crisis and the extraordinary circumstances of the COVID pandemic call for extraordinary measures. The administration believes strongly in intellectual property protections, but in service of ending this pandemic, supports the waiver of those protections for COVID vaccines. We will actively participate in catch space negotiations with the WTO to make that happen. Um, but you also noted that those negotiations will take time, given the consensus-based nature of the institution and the complexity of the issues involved. Uh, and she also noted that really they need to take other measures to ramp up vaccine supply as well. This was greeted with support by Nancy Pelosi. Uh, there has been kind of further debate in the United States Congress about this position. Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii um, and some of his colleagues have kind of pressed the Biden administration to go further and be much more active in terms of achieving uh, a TRIPS waiver for vaccines. Um, so they have kind of emphasised that they really want a stronger focus on development of and access to COVID diagnostics and treatments and strengthening uh, health systems worldwide. There has been a significant resistance campaign run against the Biden administration's support for the TRIPS waiver by Republican Senator Tom Tillis, who has been raising lots of the arguments of the pharmaceutical industry and the biotech industry and the vaccine developers arguing that there shouldn't be a TRIPS waiver at all. Uh, we'll be hearing today more about the geopolitics of the uh, TRIPS waiver. The US decision was really important. A number of other countries then moved into line to support a TRIPS waiver for vaccines. New Zealand shifted its position. We'll hear from, uh, hear from Edward Miller later about the switch within New Zealand for the TRIPS waiver. After initially kind of talking about the importance of access to medicines for global humanity, the Australian government equivocated for a long time over a TRIPS waiver and uh, finally and belatedly have said that they do support a TRIPS waiver for vaccines. There's been some non-committal responses from other countries. Been very disappointed that the Canadian government who have traditionally been kind of a pioneer in relation to access to essential medicines, have been so non-committal about a TRIPS waiver. Um, some other non-committal countries have kind of slowly come into line. So Japan and Norway have now said 
that they will not oppose the TRIPS waiver. Um, the holdouts seem to be the European Union, the United Kingdom and Switzerland. We'll have a talk from Eileen McMahon later talking about the European opposition to a TRIPS waiver. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about whether Biden should have put more pressure upon Merkel to keep to her word when she said that you know, vaccines should be treated as global public goods and be made available for everyone. Uh, but there's still kind of ongoing eruptions about whether there'll be consensus in relation to a TRIPS waiver. Uh, but there's also been a very concerted campaign to knock off the Biden administration. Uh, Pharma, the Biotech uh, Innovation Organization and the US Chamber of Commerce have all mounted a very vocal domestic campaign in the United States against the TRIPS waiver and engaged in a kind of a larger international campaign to derail the TRIPS waiver. Just want to kind of wrap up by talking about uh, ongoing debates within the White House at the moment. Uh, in terms of the White House plan, there's been a lot of discussion about a multilateral effort to end the pandemic, particularly working with COVAX to ensure vaccines are delivered. Um, there's sometimes been a little bit of criticism that the Biden administration has been much more focused upon donations of vaccines rather than unblocking uh, some of the impediments to achieving the TRIPS waiver. You know, Biden has kind of vowed that I made and I'm keeping the promise that America will become the arsenal of vaccines as we were the arsenal of democracy during World War II um, and has said that uh, he really wants to ensure that other shots are available for the rest of the world. Um, at the Global COVID Summit, South Africa's president uh, tried to kind of pick up um, language about the TRIPS waiver and the need for further action. Uh, the White House has also kind of talked a lot about public-private partnership with drug companies and vaccine developers. Um, and have also kind of talked about expanding capacity against COVID variants. Um, and I guess there's been a lot of discussion at the moment in terms of how they're responding to new variants. I guess within the uh, discussions around the ministerial conference, there has been a bit of debate about whether the Biden administration's public rhetoric is matched by their private diplomacy. And some groups like the Third World Network have kind of said that in terms of the negotiations that are going on, the US are facilitating debates, but they're not actually putting forward the text that they really prefer in relation to a TRIPS waiver. And um, the Third World Network is saying that that is really frustrating the text-based negotiations when the United States is not actually committing to any text um, Berkeley Kelich, a public citizen who appeared a few years ago at one of our conferences, has raised the question, what is the US position? Do they support the waiver as is or do they oppose it? If they oppose it, what do they support? It's been more than seven months and we still have no idea where the US stands. They could call for a general council meeting to get it passed. Um, no one knows what the US proposal is. So there's a little bit of concern about indeterminacy in terms of the diplomatic positioning of the United States. And there's also been a bit of a frustration in other fora as well. So there's discussions happening this week at World Electric Poppy Organization, and the United States there is not wanting to talk about trips at all. And they say that's been debated in another forum. But really, you know, global intellectual property issues have been debated in many for decades and decades. We've been debating access to essential medicines in WIPO for decades. It seems a kind of odd tactic by the United States. Just to finish up, Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate, and Laurie Wallach from uh, Public Citizen 
have said that the new variant highlights the urgency of the WTO waiver. The president needs to put pressure on a few countries, all close to US allies that are holding out so production can ramp up around the world. None of this will happen without stronger US leadership. And to put it in a narrow-minded way, nothing could be more important to the health of Americans and the American economy. They know that in delivering the WTO waiver and leading the mission to end the COVID-19 pandemic, Biden has a golden opportunity to restore US standing around the world and revive his domestic support, which has been hard hit by continuing public anxiety about this seemingly endless um, pandemic. And I just kind of wrap up and wonder whether or not we will get a TRIPS waiver um, by Christmas. <laughs>